but the speakers have graciously uh, agreed to introduce themselves. Uh, <laughs> since I don't know much about their background, but they, uh, our speakers today are from Spa War. Oh, here's Cynthia. And I'll let, I'll let them go ahead and get started with your presentation. And they, um, they requested that you ask questions as the presentation progresses, so feel free to uh, ask a question if you have them. Right. Okay, I'm Skip Thaler. Yeah, we just really met. We spent the last hour together, so it was unfair to ask Brett to uh, introduce us. But uh, anyway, any uh, rate, Skip Thaler from Spaywar in San Diego. And uh, we came up to uh, talk to uh, Professor Irvine on some student projects and things like that. But uh, in the process, I wanted to bring out an overview of where we're coming from. This is very informal. It may screw up the videotape, but uh, please ask questions if you have any. What we'd like to do is open a dialogue. Um, you know, if there's something here that's of interest, we can do that either online or if we need to offline at a later time. Okay? We're in PD-16 at SPAWAR in the systems engineering uh, group. Uh, I happen to be the lead on architecture for information operations. And uh, one of the important things that I wanted to point out here is that we are an acquisition command. There's an awful lot of people who will give you all sorts of opinions on information operations and information warfare, talk about it at an operational level, at a technical level, or whatever. SPAWAR is the Navy's acquisition command for, for this area. And so our slant uh, comes from that background. By necessity, we have to be operational as well. And this systems engineering, as I said to a few people earlier today, has become everything from systems engineering to technical engineering to social engineering, as I'm sure you can imagine if you've been involved with information warfare at all. I have a few points of contact here because one of the things we wanted to do was open the doors so that if anybody did need to coordinate back and forth, students, professors, whatever, uh, regular internet, SIPRNet, NSA net if you're into that. Okay? Ooh, that wasn't. <laughs> Hello. The PD 16 goal, and this is motherhood, but it brings out a few points. We got to remember that we're aiming this for our fleet warriors. Information operations capabilities that are both now and in the future. We all know that we'd like to have some whiz-bang systems out there, but we've got some legacy systems that we got to work from today. And I think one of the important things, although we're talking to Professor Irvine about primarily infosec, protect, assure type things, we are interested in integration across three major domains, protect, attack, and exploit. And as I found out at lunch today, exploit has a couple different definitions, so we'll probably go through that as we go along, okay? Through an optimized acquisition process. I'm not sure we'll ever get there, but as you may have heard, there's an awful lot of efforts to try to streamline the, the acquisition process for DOD and for the Navy. Okay. This is moving along very rapidly. <laughs> Okay. Just a little bit of background. I know there's some motherhood here, but something to keep in mind as to how we got to where we are now. There's some major changes that have happened over time. A lot of people pay lip service to these things. I'll put them up here. And uh, if there's any discussion, of course, I'd be more than happy to go into these. But these are some of the things that have brought us to where we are today. There's two slides. First of all, from an operational point of view, we've had some major changes and in, the, in these areas. You can call the words whatever you want, but um, from what I call a political point of view, we used to do wars of attrition. We used to out-attrite our enemy. And hard kill was the, the, about the only way we really did it. We're finding now that we've got to be much more surgical in what we do. This is we being the Navy, we being DOD. We've got to be uh, looking for soft kill because hard kill's not nice in a lot of cases, okay? And that's been a major change in a lot of the, what we do. We still need to implement that hard kill, but if we're going after an individual terrorist in the middle of a civilian population, 
uh, you know, dropping a bomb on the whole place is just not a nice thing to do. The mission has changed from military and tactical single service. Being a retired naval officer, we used to do an awful lot of open ocean things where it was Navy on Navy. We don't have that luxury anymore. We've shifted now to a full spectrum of operations, operations other than war, and even to, uh, well, joint uh, warfare, which we've done uh, along the way, but coalition. We were talking earlier today, Bosnia, we've got 30 different countries we've got to deal with. That changes things a big way out there. Not to beat you to death with this, the threat, I think we've, we were focused on the Soviet Union. We all know that's gone. We're now facing multifaceted enemies and even friends. And we all pay lip service to this, but we haven't really transitioned a lot of what we've done in our systems or in our operations to really deal with this new, new threat. Information used to be we'd put our information out on up until broadcasts and things like that. Now, any sailor can go out there and pull off the internet more information than you'd find on any of our tactical nets. There's still some, some push there. There's still got to be some people putting things in the right places for us to pull. But there's a major change in the way we do things. Rules of engagement, it used to be that we didn't fire until fired upon, and then we hit them with everything we got. We don't have that luxury anymore, but now we've found that we can be preemptive in certain ways. And we are very often focused in, in uh, that attack. The large scale bomb everything in sight just doesn't work. From an infrastructure, we've changed a lot as well. Our comms used to be point to point primarily. I mean, you know, you'd get some nets together, but for the most part, they were point to point. Now everything is heading towards network, network centric. And that changes not only the way we communicate, but a whole bunch as far as our vulnerabilities and what we got to protect. Technology, uh, this is where we're really concerned because from an acquisition point of view, what used to be built in 12 years now is supposed to be built in 12 months or it'll be obsolescent. Obsolete, excuse me. Programmatically, a lot of our stuff has been stovepiped. Everybody familiar with that term, I'm sure. Stovepiped not just in the program, but stovepiped uh, in the technology, stovepiped in the, the human side of it and the way we did things, okay? Everything was mill standard. Uh, now, mill standard is no more, although they still use some of those same standards in, in some of what we do. But we've moved to the evolutionary, commercial off the shelf, open architecture, everybody's a friend, and this is the way it works. Well, that's brought an awful lot of interesting phenomena along with it. Fiscal and Manning used to be robust, the good old days. Now it's very reduced. Uh, fiscally, we have to be innovative without going to jail. And Manning-wise, uh, we are expecting less and less trained people to do more and more multitask because there just aren't that many. Uh, we were looking at from an information warfare perspective, we're talking about DD-21, which is the new construction unit for the 21st century. And at one time they said, for information warfare total, you'll get four people. That's not four people per watch, that's four people total. Uh, I mean, it, you know, that's just un undoable in today's world. That requirement may or may not change, but uh, you know. As far as requirements go, one of the things that's been very interesting is it used to be kind of a directed thing. We had a very formalized process where the fleets came through with their information. They said, this is what we need. These were directed. The acquisition command went off and maybe got to postgraduate school, got some research in the process or whatever, and uh, went out and either bought something or developed a system development, had a nice, nice process of top-down requirements. Uh, now, it's all user driven, and in a lot of cases, it's commercially driven. I mean, operators come in and they'll look around a bank of computers and you say, what's your requirement? They say, I want 20 of those. Well, that's not really, you know, what we're used to being able to, to build to. So things have changed. Okay. The silence is deafening. <laughs> I know, because I haven't said anything yet, right? Okay, along this line, 
one of the things that we came up with, and again, just a little bit more background, uh, and, and this slide is, is our color burst just to, you know. Uh, it's the old OODA loop that you've all heard about. The main idea here is not to get lost in the colors or anything else, but it's the idea you've got, in order to do what we do, you go through this process. You observe, orient, decide, and act. There's a whole bunch of models. Some of these, you know, people will tell you a bunch of different things. The bottom line is you want to be able to do this process faster than your enemy. And whether you speed your process up or you slow his down, it's a very interactive thing. And in doing this, um, you're looking at protecting your side and attacking them. Okay? There's no rocket science here, but it was a colorful slide, so I brought it along. And all of this led us to this thing we now call information operations in order to do some of these things. There's a couple of things, again, another colorful slide, but uh, a couple of things that are, I guess are important here. People have asked about information operations versus information warfare. Uh, some people will tell you it's because uh, the military wanted information warfare, but justice and state and some of the other departments wanted to play, and they didn't like the warfare term because that was a little too antagonistic or whatever, so they wanted operations instead. What we've done in our dichotomy uh, of this, if that's the proper term, is information operations is the complete spectrum of things, all the way from competition you know, relatively friendly competition all the way through to conflict. And when you get somewhere around here where conflict starts to rise, we call it information warfare from then on. Some people have asked about C2W, command and control warfare, uh, which is a term that's going out of vogue right now, but for, for the most part, that's uh, really at the tactical level, okay? And you can hurt me on those definitions if you want, but that's what we're talking about. And it cuts across several different infrastructures, as you can see. Okay. Boy, I gotta stop doing that. That's in information operations, information warfare, we see three domains. And there's there's a, several different taxonomies on this. Uh, Wynn Schwartow has a huge book out, Information Warfare. Uh, that I'm sure you've all read and memorized for your next exam, those students in the thing. Uh, but uh, Schwartow goes through a bunch of different taxonomies, uh, hackers, crackers, and politicals, or uh, you know what people can do to you versus what they can do to your country versus what they can do to the multinationals or whatever. Uh, the Department of Defense has pretty much gone with this taxonom taxonomy, protect, attack, and exploit, okay? And as I said, exploit in this case, we had some definition on that. Uh, exploit, really what we're talking about for the most part is your more traditional SIGINT, the collection, your sensors, it's the driving of the information. Okay, exploit can, you know, people have trouble with the difference between exploit and attack. But you will notice that some of the individual disciplines, if you will, are similar. You got a monitor, you got in, in a couple different areas. Well, I don't know whether they use the same word, but uh, uh, detection, for example. Detection of a bad guy's signal, detection of a bad guy's unit, detection of an intrusion on your systems. So some of these things do interrelate. But these are the three basic levels that we're talking about. Now, we came up today, for the most part, to talk about the protect side, because that's the students that we're, we're dealing with. We also have some things through PD-16 where we're dealing with some, uh, some of the students who are doing exploit. I don't know whether any of are in here now, but uh, at any rate. So what we'd like to do is keep people with this focus in mind so that you're not just protecting and building firewalls and whatever in a vacuum, that you're considering, hey, what does this really mean overall? Okay, that's my pitch for that anyway. This information operations structure that's developed, uh, this is a representative slide. I don't, I don't want to get in a lot of trouble here because people say, well, wait a minute, how come this isn't on there or this is on there? What this is designed to show you is that there are a lot of different kinds of organizations 
And if you really put all of them that were involved, you just blanket the country, really. But there's a lot of different kinds of organizations that have some pretty vested interest in this thing we call information operations and information warfare. Okay, if anybody wants to discuss any of the individual ones, I'd be more than happy to do that. But uh, I, I think some of you probably know. We did put Navy Postgraduate School on there, too. I just wanted to make sure you saw that. Yeah, that's, that's not lost in Italy there. That's, that's Rome Labs. <laughs> and uh, yeah, well, they, they, there's debate. I mean, they tried to close the place, and then they were going to move them someplace, but they're, they're still there. Okay? But it does show you the diversity of what's there and the fact that it's spread across the country. If you saw a world map, it would be even more impressive, I think. We get back down to what, where we are, and again, Space and Naval Warfare Systems Command, uh, we are an acquisition command. Our primary uh, focus has been what we call C4I. I'll show you a list of some of the things we do. And integrated information systems to the fleet. And by extension, the counter to this, OK? From an acquisition sense. Key spay war roles that might be of interest, as I said, most of our programs are information pervasive. Of course, information is everywhere. I mean, you know, it's, it's hard to say we do information. Everybody does information. But we are the lead in C4ISR. You may want to tell them about this, how surveillance Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, the, another buzzword. It, it makes sense. Command control, communications, and computers, I think, is where the, the fourth C came in. Intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance is what the ISR stands for, but uh, okay. Um, and Navy cross-platform integration. We've got Nav C, we've got Nav Air, we've got people that focus in on you know, individual platform things. We do the acquisition for what happens between ships, between ships and planes and things. We're a naval technology broker, although our boss, Admiral John Goss, would like to be the tech. And then after this, we'll all stand up. Yeah, I know. Um, anyway, Jack, a little later, Jack Stavisky may uh, use this slide again just for real quickie. But here's the program directorates. Basically, this is where we come in. If anybody's been familiar with Spaywar, it's just an org chart, but this is where our, our highlight is. And it's, it's already out of date. It's information warfare systems. We've dropped the and electronic. We, still, most of what we do is still electronic, but they just had a name change because they had nothing better to do, I think. Anyway, the three key things here are the 161, 162, and 163, which have been aligned by the protect, attack, and exploit disciplines. But those numbers are the acquisition hats that they're, they're wearing. And what we're trying to do, again, it's nice to figure out just what these things need to do operationally. But then we also have to meet all the acquisition rules and buy systems in accordance with that. And so what we're finding is that while we can make up a real nice integra integration concept for a con ops, and why these things should work together operationally. <coughs> Excuse me. That doesn't necessarily mean that when you buy your systems, you're, you're not going to end up stovepiped again in, in just by the, the systems that you acquire. It's a challenge on both fronts. What we're trying to do at PD-16 level, most of what we do today will be the 161 chain. It's paid for by a sponsor. It comes through, the money comes through, and some money will even come up here to uh, uh, sponsor some research and things. And that's the fiscal chain. But what we're trying to do at the 16 level is to see what we can do to integrate for both the future system design and taking the stovepipes that we currently have and enhancing them even in what they're doing, because you can't just change overnight. And that's a real challenge. 
Okay, real quick on the missions, and Jackie may end up going through this a little bit more. 161's mission, primarily InfoSec, okay? I'm not gonna read through all these. I don't know, you know, that'll really put you to sleep, but uh, Jack, if you have anything that you'd like to highlight on that. Now this is gonna, con well, here's a couple of the program areas that, th that 161 is involved in, and again, key management, Network system security, engineering systems, or engineering services, okay? This may be a little bit confusing because people get mystified when they hear about 162. 162 is actually not in San Diego at all. It's 3,000 miles away. It's the Navy IW activity, okay? Uh, NIWA. If any of you have had any experience working with them. And you'll notice that they claim some protect and some exploit and some attack. It's a convoluted thing just like anything else in the Navy. Uh, they wear several different hats. NIWA is through, uh, from ComNav Secru, is an executive agent for information warfare in the Navy. But as an acquisition command, our activity, they report to us, okay? So what they're trying to do in their normal job is build the research and figure out how to do some of these mystifying things. As an acquisition command, they have to figure out how to then put those capabilities on 25 or 30 or 40 ships. And it's a real challenge to, to mix the two, especially because we're in, in San Diego and they're 3,000 miles away. But I think you may, I, I'm not sure whether, how much NIWA funding comes through here or whether anybody's involved in that, but uh, you may get some separate briefs from them. They're located at, he said, getting ahead of himself, a couple different places. I'm not sure if anybody uh, recognizes those. I'm not sure that it really matters, but uh, they've got a place at NRL. They've got a place at uh, Fort Meade. And actually, that's the wrong building. Uh, n nobody caught me yet, but uh, that, their building is really up the street a little bit. But it was Fort Meade, and that was the only picture they let us take. So, And then this is down in Suitland, Maryland. Okay, huge complex down there, very nice uh, thing. And you can see some of the things that they're into. TDOA is time distance of arrival. It's a direction finding capability. Okay. We're not getting any questions yet, okay. Is this really this boring or, you know, <laughs> any, any thoughts? Okay, all right. And we've got the 163 mission. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the traditional exploit things. It's uh, tactical cryptologic systems, uh, some of the naval security group stuff, and what we do uh, providing the cryptologic systems out to fleet units, okay? What we are going through, I don't have a slide on this right now, but uh, 163 is the cryptological uh, side of things working in conjunction with ComNav Secru, has been looking at how to bring its cryptologic, afloat cryptologic systems together into the future way of doing things, okay? And at the same time to bring all three disciplines of IW into, into focus. Now, any of you who have been involved in some of the more traditional SIGINT things in the past know that every NAVSECRU brief you've ever heard probably starts off with something like we're 99% passive. If you add the attack capability to any of this, all of a sudden it's a whole new world. And I'm not, when I say attack, I'm not necessarily talking about smoking and burning and blowing things up, but even the idea of injecting bad things into somebody's system becomes just a whole new world to the technology and to the operators. So it's a major change in the way we're doing business. But at any rate, we're looking for these, I'll show you a collapse slide later, but uh, we're looking for these current systems and how these things will then fit into the cryptologic and eventually IW system of the future. 
One of, the, one of the strategies that they're looking at is a thing called Jimios. I don't have any slides on that right now, but we can talk about that offline for anybody that might be interested. Okay. On these, just so you have the uh, breakouts, Big Fees, the Battle Group Passive Horizon Extension System, now in danger because of the ES3 going away. Um, the concept is, is, a, is a given. It's extending your radio horizon when you're out there. You've got to do that somehow. How this thing finally breaks out now that, it finally, now that we finally figured out it works after 20 years and they're going to take our platform away, we'll figure that out. Whether we go through a U2 or whether we go through some other platform or whatever, we need that extension out there. Chibdo is just the, um, the data link for that. Uh, Combat DF and Code Blue are SIGIN exploitation and direction finding systems. Code Blue is the uh, follow on. It's a US and UK program uh, to follow on for the outboard system. Yes, sir? Is uh, Code Blue Phase 1 been implemented to the point now? It's on Radford. And uh, what is truly amazing to us in the acquisition command, I don't want to say anything bad about it because I, I ran the program from NRAD for three years. Um, We've had a lot of acquisition problems with it. It's, it's some cutting edge stuff. But when we put it on Radford, the operators loved it. And, th and that's a major success for anything, because that's really the ultimate consumer. Uh, their CEO sent us an email, not a Navy message now, but an email, and uh, just said, there is absolutely no way you're going to take this off my ship. I did this, 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 and this to these bad guys during the exercise. And I was, well, I, won't, <laughs> I don't want to get too excited here, but I mean, uh, it, the guy just thought it was great. So it's I not. With, uh, phase zero. You did? Yes, I did. Oh, good. Okay. On, on Karen. And there were several, we ran into several uh, problems with phase zero. Right. And, and they said that a lot of the problems, we, we, uh, I sent several emails to you know, Charleston. Okay. A lot of the things that I had identified as, as problems or anomalies were going to be corrected in phase one. So I was kind of wondering. How well is Radford doing phase one, and when are they going to implement phase one into the fleet? Yeah, phase one, as I said, is on Radford. It passed uh, its fat factory acceptance testing. It had some problems in the actual op uh, testing. Not, I, I don't want to say op eval, but it was the uh, DT testing that they did out there. Uh, they're still running it through, but like I said, even in its pre-approved state, Radford has loved it, okay? But you know the, the glitches to it. You do bring up one major point, though, if I can digress just a, just a little bit. Spruance CO, who took phase zero, said the same thing about phase zero. He said, do not take this off my ship. You will get it out of my cold, dead fingers, so to speak, okay? And yet, you're absolutely right. Some of the subsequent ships that got phase zero had problems with it. And this is one of the challenges of the acquisition command. We put all sorts of effort into that first ship. We send tech reps out there, and we have the guys come to San Diego, and we do everything possible to make sure that that system goes through the, the, the hardest part, I mean, you know, and gets passed and everything else. What do we do for ship number two or ship number three? A lot of times it's, hey, here's your system. Uncrate the box and we'll see you later, right? I mean, it may not have been quite that bad with you, but okay. When it works, it's, it's, it's great. Oh, that's good to hear. That, that. Yeah, it, it really is. Well, there, uh, phase one, I should tell you, is really a very different system, different architecture and everything else. Phase zero had an information backplane that kicked our tail for a long time. And they've changed a whole bunch of the structure, but I, I could communicate with you offline in case uh, you know that's still an interest, because uh, that was a very interesting process. Not only because we went through everything that the US could possibly do, but we also had the UK there. And that made it very interesting. The C and, C and uh, CCOP, the carry-on cryptologic programs are the other things that we're looking at. And we're trying to figure out now what's the best architecture for out there. You've got enemies where you want a permanent establishment to go out and fight uh, there. You will have some other places where you take your ship into harm's way, and you want to be able to carry on the latest and greatest technology. The problem with that is it comes to the ship, and 
if you don't have people that are ready to operate with it, it makes it very difficult. So it's a real challenge to us, not just operationally, but acquisitionally. Okay. What we're trying to do, motherhood slide, is take all those Crayola box things and turn them into an integrated information operations capability. Not necessarily one box fits all, although that's one of the things we are looking for, okay? But certainly an integrated capability for information operations. And the real goal is an integrated functionality. Now there's some things that have been very interesting through here. We kept the green here as the so-called real-time line from sensor to shooter. IW brings to play the fact that you can shoot lethal weapons, you can also shoot electrons or viruses or whatever else you want to, the soft kill aspect of it. And we're just beginning to understand what that's all about. But these things, whether it's hard kill combat direction systems or um, IW attack type systems, it can be real time. Unfortunately, we've got these things like intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance, the GEMCOMs and the GEMSYS that you've all heard about, that tend to be non-real time. There's a major challenge figuring that out, okay? That's it. I'm not going <laughs> to, I won't beat you to death with the rest of that. And the last thing we did, we put up some of the, I, I'm, I'm not sure that you'll be able to use these, but we'll, uh, Cynthia will have a copy of this afterwards. There's some interesting URLs uh, off the regular internet. We have some others off CIPRNET and NSANET and JWIX if you have access to those things. Uh, these are just some things that you might want to take a look at from a variety of different uh, aspects. InfoSec, InfoAttack, InfoExploit. Uh, That's the political introduction side of things. Not much tech there, but I would be more than happy to talk about any of the areas we may be going in PD-16, either here or offline. And if we have some questions, uh, we could take them right now. Or if we don't, I can turn it over to Jack Stavisky, who will talk. Yes, sir. Just real quick, you mentioned you worked at NRAD for a while. What's the relationship between SPA war or SPA war right. and NRAD uh, in general and in particular with uh, information warfare? Okay. Um, NRAD, now called Spay War Systems Center San Diego, if that tells you anything, is a lab under the Spay War tutelage, if you will. Okay? Spay War, as you probably know, used to be Navalex a long time ago. You know, Spay War was in D.C., and primarily in Crystal City. About a year ago, they moved out, a year and a half ago now, they moved out, uh, what, out of 1,000 employees, I think 300 came west. So they had to pick up people from a variety of different sources, not the least of which was uh, then NRAD, the Navy lab in San Diego. Uh, that's how I moved across. I think Jack had been over a little bit before that, but we both came from NRAD before that. Um, the connection with Spay War and NRAD used to be relatively looser, looser at the, at the Navy lab point of view than it was at the Spaywar point of view. Spaywar said, hey, that's my lab, but they actually provided only about 30% of the funding for the lab, so the lab was out doing other business. Now that we're both co-located in San Diego, NRAD out on the point and Spaywar in the industrial strength misery along Pacific Highway there, okay, <laughs> Uh, it's a much closer relationship, and especially because a lot of us have come over to Spaywar, taking the promotions given up by our Ocean View offices. Uh, and that relationship has worked very well. The other major player in that chain is Spaywar Systems Center uh, Charleston, okay, which is our East Coast, West Coast uh, coordination. Uh, as far as information warfare goes, I, I I will use one example as a, a, you know, the relationship because this is kind of exciting if we can get into it. It, it. it leaves a lot open for research and everything else. The Navy lab, NRAD, now SSC San Diego, is 
forming an I.O. center of the future. In fact, t tomorrow, they start a, their first war game with Com Third Fleet in the center of the future. Now, it's going to be kind of a manual thing because not all the electronics are in there yet. But they've got all sorts of systems that they've put in to this space in a futuristic um, <coughs> excuse me, command center. Um, there, there is a command center of the future and an I.O. center of the future. And Spaywar and NRED have worked pretty closely on this uh, to set that up. And I think that you're going to find that that's going to be a good place to showcase uh, some new I.O. ideas, things that uh, might not be able to get tested out anyplace else. Eventually, that's going to be connected with post-grad school, uh, Naval War College, a uh, bunch of different places that we're looking at uh, connecting. Does that tend to answer your question, or was there yes, something else? Grab the real bits lab and integrate into your uh, uh, one of your demonstration labs. Uh, have they done that? Yeah, I know. I know there are plans to tie together a lot of those kinds of things. I'm not sure what the actual status. Do you happen to know? Yeah. Plans, but yeah. Right. Because I know we were doing joint uh, modeling and simulation eff efforts uh, with RISA and everything nationwide uh, across the board. I think you're going to find Spaywar and NRAD may kind of, uh, I mean, they're, they're not one and the same, but a lot of the people are dual-hatted. Uh, so that part of it will probably be together. But uh, we're really looking for collaborative, distributed type things. One of the things we do with post-grad school now is through the, the uh, NSA net. And again, I'm not sure how many people are into that, but uh, we do video conferencing uh, between primarily NSA, NAF Postgrad School, and Spaywar uh, NRAD. It's actually at NRAD uh, through the Gigster setup that they have uh, through NSA Net on a video teleconference. It's pretty cool. Uh, so we're looking for those kinds of interactions. What we'd like to do. The information operations center of the future, if you will, they'd like to hold that war game and be able to play up on the displays, people from around the country doing things at the, at the classified level and actually play that in a distributed sense. Uh, this war game, is it uh, Navy-centric or is it a joint war game like with McTissa or one man up the road? This first one, I believe, is going to be whatever Third Fleet wants, but there will be some joint flavor. I, just as a practical thing, having seen these things develop, I would imagine there's, it'll be maritime, let's call it that. That's a little bit of a compromise there. Certainly, um, they will bring in marine flavor. Uh, they will be some joint considerations, but I'm not yet satisfied that we're joint by any means, if that's what you're getting to. You know, we're, we're still working in that direction. One last question now. Yes, sir. Uh, so you can move on. Uh, oh, that's uh, fine. Since NRAD now falls under Spay War, right. does that mean if, like, McTissa or OneMF want support from a particular program office or a particular expertise at NRAD, it's still going to be fee for service? Uh, yeah, the, the difficulty that we face, the two labs, both Charleston and um, NRAD, and a lot of Navy labs, too. I'm not sure who is and who isn't. But several years ago, they went to a DBOF funding. And you're going to ask me what DBOF is, and I'll be damned if I can remember the tetragraph there. But uh, Defense, uh, something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thanks. <laughs> Budgeting office funding or something like that. I have a few acronyms I could probably tell you, but I'd be thrown out. Uh, <laughs> but what it is is basically that government employees at the labs have to have a sponsor pay money for their salary and their, and their uh, funding, just like a defense contractor does. Now, the good news is it starts the juices flowing. You do get some competition. You do get moving. The bad news is that when a fleet unit needs help, it's very difficult for this guy to say, hey, you need help. I'm going to come out there and I'll do it without money because he's, he's working you know, for his salary. Now, if a sponsor you know, can provide that money, then, then we're golden. But it has been a, a difficult issue. Spaywar, as a Echelon 2 command, uh, does not do that. Our salaries are paid for. Okay? <laughs> they don't give us any other money, but I mean, you know. <laughs> and we're, okay? Red falls under Spaywar. Spaywar is funded, but yet to get any help from Inrad, specifically, you pay money. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you can work some things because it's fleet, because it's fleet marine force or fleet, or fleet 
Uh, you know, we have very often worked in the past where, you know, you try to do the most you can to make sure that it happens, even, uh, even if there's not money. Yeah, that, go ahead. Uh, in N6, um, N6 uh, being in Pentagon or wherever they are located right now, has set five priorities. And fleet uh, operations, of course, comes as priority number one. Priority number two is the year 2000 problem. Priority number three is Link 16. Priority number four is. Um, oh. uh, I got them. Okay. You're talking about for spare war? Well, for yeah. N6, which would imply. But anyway, yeah. fleet operations, that is the point I'm making, being number one. Right. If there's a problem and you've got to have it solved, then N6 will do everything they can. Oh, IT21, of course, is number yeah. four. Year you know, 2K. Yeah. <laughs> and then number five is uh, everything else. Okay? Right. So if you don't fall in those four categories, uh, if you go to your sponsors uh, who are in N6, like we have a sponsor, a PMW 161, our sponsor is N643, which right. is in Pentagon. And basically, uh, you, he uh, constantly asks those questions. How much of the money I'm giving you is going to be spent on IT21? How much of your money is going to be spent on the year 2000 problem, and so on and so on. Uh, and you can stretch it any way you want to, because we can say IT21 is really getting the information to the fleet. So therefore, everything we buy for PMW 161 could relate to that. But is it really? Because you know it's kind of by definition, what is IT21? So sometimes if you do an upgrade to uh, a, a facility up in uh, Seattle or in uh, Puget Sound, where you install some new firewall or something, is that really IT21? You know, probably not, okay? But if you'd install something on George Washington on uh, US MTM prior to deployment, and the ship is IT-121 uh, IT uh, configured, then definitely that would be, you know. Uh, so to answer your question, because that's an important one, it applies to a lot of you as you get to your future assignments, is uh, if you can work closely with the, um, the acquisition agent, which is Spaywar, then there are things that can be done because there's money we send over to SSC San Diego. There's a bunch of money we send to SSC Charleston, money we send to NRL. The program manager, the PMW himself, who in 99% uh, of the cases is an 06, basically. That's the job that you would probably be someday getting. Uh, we civilians would end up working for the 06. They have that authority to basically redirect the resources that they control. So if PMW 161 has, you know, whatever, you know, there's a considerable amount of money because there's a lot of acquisition involved. So, you know, we're talking like 80 to 90 million dollars probably. That money can be redirected, not just, some of that is specifically put in and aside for research and development. Some of that money is put aside for procurement, obviously. You can't really take the procurement dollars because of congressional uh, uh, constraints. And uh, that's, that's a really strict constraint. You know, that's one thing you cannot play with is the uh, LPN. But, you have a lot of flexibility with almond dollars, which is sort of pays for a lot of different things that could be used for uh, not just salaries of those individuals, but some other related things. Uh, so um, anyway, um, I think that's maybe that answered the question. Yeah. I'm sorry, I was smirking because when he said 80 to 90 million dollars, Cynthia's eyes just started watering, you know. <laughs> sorry, I didn't mean to catch you on that. Yes, sir. sir you Right. What, what are you doing or how are you focusing on the integrated support requirement to operate and maintain all that equipment, whether it's networked into other systems that currently exist or if it's future systems that are coming? How are you dealing with that problem? And if not, what could be done to help that? Excellent question. And, and from a prior, you know, as I said, retired naval officer point of view, uh, that's always been one of my concerns when uh, watching us put all this commercial stuff out there and then everybody's happy for six months until version two comes along and then you go, well, wait a minute, how, how are we going to afford this next upgrade? Um, in the InfoSec arena, and I'll focus on that because that's what we came up here for, uh, Charleston has set up, and in fact, even in some of the things we did in the Info exploit area from PD-16 at least, Charleston did set up a fleet support office, you know, 1-800-HELP type thing uh, that uh, has worked out uh, both with their install teams and with problems that has come back. But uh, 
I think your question included, are there weaknesses in that system? You didn't say that, but I think that's what uh, was implied, and I would say definitely. You know, you're off the, uh, well, I won't say Kamchatka Peninsula, because I guess we don't go there anymore, but, uh, you know, South China Sea or whatever at, uh, you know, 3 o'clock Sunday morning, and uh, your uh, Microsoft Word craps out and nobody can talk to each other, you know, uh, wh where do you go for help? And it's, it's been a, a very definite problem be with, commercial assets going out there. As I said, I think Charleston's done a pretty good job of providing a point of contact for that kind yeah, of thing. That's uh, in my brief, which I... Oh, you're going to yeah, go... No, good. we're not going to do it because the time is up, okay? So, well, we'll just... I'll just get invited again. That's great, you know? <laughs> <laughs> How do we do that? That's fine. Yeah, don't okay. Know. But maybe, you know, just to... Uh, there is a lot of emphasis. Captain Gaelic with PMW 161, one thing he wants to make across uh, very clear that anytime we have an opportunity to talk to people like yourselves, that we tell you about the, the training and the uh, websites that are available, and that's all in, in, I will make sure that Cynthia has that because there's an 800 number help desk that we pay for, okay? And it's uh, 724, you know, it takes like, you know, a lot of people to run it and it's not a cheap thing to do. But anytime that people have questions, fleet people or anybody else, you know, you, you also have questions on the network security or what instructions currently exist or what policies are currently being uh, implemented on uh, firewalls or guards or whatever it may be. Uh, they are the ones that can either answer your question or if not, they'll get back to you within 24 hours. So the idea is that they have the expertise. In some cases, they'll go to people in San Diego, for example. That's right. That's a good To get point. some questions because San Diego sort of specializes in software. Uh, uh, upgrades and things of that nature. So anything with software related, the Charleston would probably immediately reroute the call to San Diego if it's during working hours. And not, they will say, I'll get back to you. Or they could go to Hawaii. We have uh, uh, four or five people in uh, Hawaii, which is really part of uh, Space War System Center San Diego. They have a detachment in Hawaii. They are there because of the uh, proximity to the fleet. They have the expertise that can, instead of sending, if there's a problem, or a lot of installations that take place. You know, we have so many installations going on around the world. That's where the money is being spent. Um, where you have teams of people going on the, uh, not just installations, but doing the BGC, which is the battle group uh, uh, in, in integration uh, uh, of, of systems. And it's uh, based security integration. And they actually go on board a ship. Maybe some of you, if, if you have been in the fleet, you know it. Uh, but we're trying to emphasize that and do more of it next year, or this year, rather, fiscal 99. We haven't seen our money yet, but uh, it's coming, supposedly. So, uh, was, was there a follow-on to that, though, or I does guess, it? Uh, my concern is yeah. leaning more to the issue of we keep buying new equipment that does great, wonderful things. It, it truly is needed. However, we stop short of looking at okay, what are the total requirements that these techs and these uh, support personnel are providing? Well, they can handle one more system, so we give them one more system and then another system, and we're not taking things out, or if we are, it's not a equitable distribution. So in line of the acquisition strategy that you mentioned, maybe it's time too to look at what are the total requirements that can be handled and maybe they all need to be integrated to best support everything, all the new equipment and all the new equipment. Uh, one, one point I wanted to make about that, uh, from Spayware's point of view, we have just established, wh whenever you have a problem, establish a new code, right? But there is a new code under uh, Captain Now, Admiral Select language in 04, where they are going to do, hopefully, just what you said. When they do installations, they are looking at the total package across the Spaywar lines, because 